All right, it's great to see everybody here today, and uh, so excited about what's coming up in the month of March and in months to come. We finally got a little cool weather around here, and well, like has already been mentioned so many times this morning, we are so very, very sorry for the loss that uh, Lee and Michelle have experienced uh, here um, this past week. I remember like yesterday, which now is almost 10 years ago, the first time that I met Lee and Michelle. We uh, uh, saw them out at Pine Road Park at an all-church picnic, and it was uh, difficult times for the Broad Street Church. And it's hard to believe and even to imagine now, but back in those days, Katie Beth wasn't even around yet, and Kyla and Hamilton comprised almost the entirety of our youth. That was about it. We really almost had nothing else. But that was enough to begin. And we began, and we began to build the church family. And it's not that you have to have certain components and all these other kinds of things, but the hopefulness that uh, came through our time together over the last nine and a half years to be able to I started children's ministry and to be able to grow into a youth ministry and to be able to add families and to develop to the point that we have now is a reason, I think, for all of us to rejoice. And I just want Lee and Michelle to know publicly how appreciative I am of all of their encouragement and faithful support to this church uh, over those past nine and a half years. It's meant the world to me, Lee and Michelle. It has. And I'm so happy that we're able to uh, uh, rally and to uh, wrap them up in the love of this church and in God's love and to rejoice, not at their loss, but at the thankfulness of, for their safety and for the faith that they have displayed throughout this ordeal. If you didn't hear, Lee came in this morning and requested that we please not sing Light the Fire today. He really didn't want to hear that song this morning. Uh, but uh, um, God is good. And God will continue to bless Broad Street. But more importantly today, I have no doubt in all the confidence in the world that God will continue to bless Lee and Michelle and their family. And it just so happens that one of the things that I'll be talking about this morning speaks to that directly. Beginning on Wednesday night, we're going to have a 10-week study of New Testament worship. Originally, it was a 13-week study, but uh, on the last Wednesday night of each month, We'll be doing singing in March and April and May, so we're going to be condensing it down to a 10-week study on what the Bible has to say about New Testament worship. We're not going to be talking about modes of worship and styles of worship, but the theology of New Testament worship, where it comes from, what it's about, what is corporate worship, what is private worship, what is family worship, how does it all come together uh, to do that. And so what I'd like to do this morning is share with you some concepts that I think are most important as we enter into this time. And I want to encourage everyone uh, to come and to be a part of our Wednesday night uh, schedule, uh, to come and enjoy the time that we have together to share in a wonderful family meal, and then uh, to assemble here in this room as adults at 6.30 and uh, have our study for the next uh, 10 sessions on New Testament worship. But any time that you talk about worship, probably in the New Testament, the place to start is John chapter 4. I know I have Psalm 42 on the board, but we're going to start with, Psalm, with John chapter 4. It is the most powerful, one of the most powerful stories in the Bible. It is Jesus at the woman, meeting the woman at the well in Samaria, a woman who is outcast by her ethnicity, who is outcast by her morality who is an outcast based on every aspect of life. She is a woman in a man's world. She is a divorced woman in a, in a married world. And in fact, she's been divorced so many times, it's ridiculous. And now she is living with a man outside of marriage uh, in a married world. She is uh, a Samaritan in a Jewish world. And Jesus is sitting by the well asking her for some water to lead into the conversation that follows. And when she begins to probe and to try to figure out what it is that God wants in her life and what is right, should we have to go to Jerusalem, as the Jews say, or should we go to the mountains, as our fathers did in, 
in the north after the kingdom divided. Jesus cuts her off, and he says, beginning in verse 21, he says, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But in spite of all that, just set that aside, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, spirit and truth stand in contrast to the mountains and Jerusalem, okay? Because what she wants to know is location. And Jesus goes straight through that. Instead of saying, instead of worrying about whether you should be in Jerusalem or in the mountains, what we're going to focus on is the reality that an hour is coming and now has actually arrived when the Father will seek out those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And when the true, uh, uh, for such people, the Father seeks to be His worshiper. Now, where I want to begin as we get into this is not spend time defining what is spirit and what is truth. You have to come back on Wednesday night, so we'll get into that a little bit. But the place to begin is to understand that God is pursuing worshipers. God is looking for people to come and to worship Him. God is on the prowl, wanting people to come and to worship Him. And God is not indifferent toward our worship. Jesus says here, God is seeking a certain kind of worshiper. Not a worshiper that is tied to a mountaintop or to a building in Jerusalem. But He is seeking a worshiper. God is jealous uh, for uh, His infinite worth. And what God seeks as we study worship in the New Testament are people who appreciate and understand that, and that means that we are to ascribe to Him worship that glorifies and magnifies His infinite worth. This is actually the same kind of theme that Roger started us out on this morning. We haven't talked about this all week at all. It just kind of worked out that way. God is seeking for you and for me not only to worship Him, but to worship Him in a particular way. And that way is to bring Him glory by ascribing to Him the worth that is His because of His holiness, because of His power. If you go to the book of Revelation, I have my college class on Sunday morning, and we've been going through Revelation 4 and 5, and what you find in there is a series of worship services. And when uh, the, the, the focus of the attention in the book of Revelation hones in on the center of the throne. And there is the Ancient of Days on the throne, uh, the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures bow down and they cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy is Lord God Almighty. And they worship Him and they say, Because we're worshiping You because You have created the world and we worship You because You have conceived the creation of the world. You have designed it and we worship You because You hold everything together. And then in the very next scene, in the center of the throne, no longer is the Ancient of Days, but it is the Lion, the one who is worthy to open the seven seals. And when John looks to see a lion, what he sees instead is a lamb who has a blood stain on one side. And once again, the angelic hosts bow down and worship him. And the reason they worship him says, because you were offered up, you were dead, and you live again, and with your blood you have purchased men for God. You have redeemed the world. And so God is seeking worshipers who ascribe to Him His infinite worth in terms of His power and His glory and His design and His redemption and everything that is about His person. We get so caught up when we want to talk about worship and we want to dismiss it in terms of using words like, well, that's a certain style or that's a certain this. And I've been told all my life by people, how worship ought to be. I've been told to people uh, 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 how I should dress when I worship. I've been told to people how long my hair should be when I worship. I've been told to people what kind of Bible I'm supposed to read when I'm in worship. I've been told by people what kind of songs I'm supposed to sing. I've been told by people how I'm supposed to sit. I've been told to people when I'm supposed to stand. I don't, and, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And what gets lost in all of this is that the reason that we have assembled here is to ascribe to God the glory that is His because of His infinite 
glory and power. And God is jealous for that. God is seeking worshipers for that. And so it should not surprise us that the Bible speaks powerfully concerning corporate worship. And this brings us to the 42nd Psalm. There David wrote, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts to God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food both day and night. And when they say to me all day long, where is your God? Now you have to get this picture. David is not writing this psalm because it's a good day. David is writing this psalm because it's a very, very, very bad day. And he is depressed and discouraged. But then verse 4, he says, These things I remember when I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng. That's a lot of people. That's corporate. Okay? And lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving and a multitude keeping festival. It begs to ask the question, where is our God? This is the criticism of those who would not join with us. This is the battle that we fight against those who persist in darkness. And this is what happens to our own lives. David calls himself up out of depression by recalling his corporate worship experience. So it has to be powerful. And so the question that flies out of this is, do you have a regular worship with God and with God's people that so enliven you and that so awaken you and so move you inside that it validates within you your walk with God simply because of the authentic intensity that we bring with us into our time of worship that causes that same intensity to rise up in our soul. It terrifies me that we create a culture that suppresses intensity in worship. When David says, when things were the worst in my life, what I recalled was there was a day that I was with God's people going into his house, leading them in procession. And we were making festival. We were with God. And I know that God is real because of that day. I know that the Bible is true because of that worship experience. I know that God is with us because he was with us on that day. We get so caught up in trying to take our worship and push it into something that will validate whatever distinctive attributes we ascribe to ourselves as a fellowship of people. Or we take our worship and we try to ritualize it in such a way so that we make sure that everything is accomplished in a certain way and on time that sometimes we forget that the purpose of all of this is to be there because the day is going to come when you are going to be panting for God just like a deer pants for water. He's not talking about this of being hungry for God's word. He's not talking about this being, I'm so tired of celebrating God that I'm panting like a deer. What he's saying is, I'm about to die here. I got nothing. And everybody around me is telling me this isn't so. But I remember a day when I was with God's people and God showed up. The authentic intensity of corporate worship becomes our anchor as we go through life. It's such an important concept. We need to know him. We need to know him in this moment. So that later when the devil is beating us up with all kinds of doubts and difficult circumstances, you can say, I was once with the throne and there was a glorious moment. 
And those moments were real. And I'm able to call to mind God's experience in my own life when I was with you in worship with God. Now, generally, there are two views of worship that come into play, or three, actually. One is that the only thing that worship really accomplishes is to fulfill specific commandments that God has given us. And that's not true at all. And we'll spend several sessions in our deal talking about what the Bible actually says about the commands concerning worship. But there's another view that says that the reason we're here is to demonstrate our submissive reverence to God. And there's all kinds of scripture for this. I call your attention to Isaiah chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. For thus the Lord spoke to me with the mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or to be in dread of it. It is is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy and he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. We're going to stop right there. God is to be feared. Now what is he driving at here? That when we come into worship we're supposed to hush and we're supposed to stay quiet. We're never supposed to express joy or have a smile on our face, or laugh at anything that is funny. Once again, we need to look at the text. Don't do what other people do who aren't my people. People fear war. People fear economic collapse. People fear cancer. People fear for their money, their possessions, their property. And God says, I don't want you to fear that way. I want you to fear me. If you fear me, all of these other fears will go away. And this is the last line that we didn't read. If you'll do this, then I will be your sanctuary. I will be your resting place. I will be your refuge. So that when the day of trouble comes, you'll be just fine. Yes, we are to hold God around. God says, look. If you want to come before me, what you need to understand is that you need to expect to come into the presence of holy righteousness. And you better have something that's a part of your life that will keep God from becoming a consuming fire in your life. This is absolutely part of what we are all about. You have instances where, for example, well, all of them. I don't even have to go through and name them. If there's one consistent thing that everybody shares in common when they meet God is they are terrified out of their mind because they know how unworthy they truly are. Whether it's Daniel and he just faints and passes out on the floor, or if it's Isaiah that says, Woe is to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but the idea behind this is that a fear of God brings with it salvation. It brings deliverance. It brings the understanding that there is something more powerful than myself. We live in a time where some people want to make worship almost like slapstick. And I understand that. And that's not what I'm talking about in any regard. But to come into God's presence before Him and to understand that He is greater than anything that we could ever conceive. He is stronger than anything I could ever construct. He is well far beyond anything I could envision. And for me to have the audacity to come in and try to lay down the law or try to tell other people what God's mind is all the time is such a presumptuous, stupid thing that sometimes it almost makes me ashamed to be a preacher. But the reality of the situation is that with that fear also comes a comfort. Because if my God isn't that great and wonderful, how's he going to deliver me in my day of difficulty and struggle and trouble? When doubts come into my life, when I lose someone that I love, or when something befalls me that I never anticipated, an awesome God who is holy and majestic and deserves reverence is the only God that will do. And when I understand that, as Isaiah tells us, I find myself in the presence of a sanctuary. 
I don't have to fear what other people see. My fear of God brings my comfort. It's not a slavish, or it's not a demeaning, or it's not a cowering, miserable relationship. But it is an understanding that he is my sanctuary. And he says, I will keep you. Dread me. Fear me. And I'll protect you. That's the promise. And so when we come and we gather and we worship God, it would be good to think on these things, I think. Before we sit down and we look through the song list and decide which ones are worthy of our participation and which ones aren't. Or before we stand up and mouth a prayer that we've mouthed a hundred times before. Or if we just Go through whatever motion that we go through. We need to be filled with dread and with fear. But then the third view is that everything should be happy clappy. That it all should just be a smile and everything's going to be fine and all you need to do is be happy and everything. And I don't mean to be demeaning or to put anybody down because actually what we see is that the Bible is replete with passages. Look at Psalm 43. There the psalmist said, O oh, send out your light and your truth and let them lead me and let, me bring, and let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I will praise you, O oh, my God, my God. I am going to praise you all the days of my life with exceeding joy. And the question is, why can't it be both? Why does it have to be an either or? Why can't I be filled with dread and fear of the power and the majesty and the greatness and the glory of God? And at the same time, because he is my sanctuary, allow that to be my joy that expresses itself in so many wonderful ways. So what should our worship look like? Well, it should be deliberate and intense in bringing glory and majesty to our God and our Father. Once again, I refer to the Psalms. We see several. Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you, the Psalm says in Psalm 33. And I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all of my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. You want to talk about the different aspects of worship that matter. There has been one consistency that has been from the beginning. And that consistency has been that God has always called on His people to lean heavily on poetry and music to express the joy and the glory that is swelling up with inside themselves. It's undeniable. It's been there from the very beginning. When... Uh, the deliverance of God's people came through. Moses' sister couldn't help but to break out into song. When David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city, he made a complete baboon out of himself. He was so happy, he actually offended the self-righteous of his family that was with him. And they even dared to scold the king of Israel on the way that he behaved. David wrote all of these songs. And as soon as the church was established, not only did they lean heavily upon their songs, these songs, but they also began to write their own. And the idea of music being incorporated into our expression of not only our joy, but also our fear of the reverence and the loving kindness of God, to be expressed authentically, not ritualistically, not worried about whether that note's a triangle or a diamond or a bowl, or if we've got the harmonies just right, but to be able to express from our innermost part the intensity of God's reality in our lives so that when the day of trouble comes, I can remember the day that I walked with the throng in the presence of God is what we're talking about. And it's so fundamental. It is so basic. I can't believe that I spent so many years of my life 
thinking that worship was a formula, a math problem, and not even realizing what God has called us to be able to do. Our worship has to be deliberate, intense, and it has to appeal to the heart as well as to the head. In Ephesians 5, Paul talking about life, not Sunday morning. And we'll talk about all worship, all life being worship and our work is worship, which absolutely is positively the case. Everything that we should be about is a spiritual service, which is the definition of worship unto God. But here to the church at Ephesus, he says, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish and understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with the wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be intoxicated with God's presence. That's the contrast. If you want a buzz, if you want a high, there are two ways you can go. You can manufacture that chemically, or you can experience with God. Now, who in the world, in our present day, would ever want to compare the experience of being filled with God with the experience of being a drunkard? We run from that like the plague. But there it is. It is so plain, it's undermined. And so he says, what I want you to do is I want you to speak to one another. I want you to do it in music and in poetry. I want you to do it in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing it out. I know what that word solo means. Solo means to pluck, and you are to pluck the strings of your heart. So that my presence here should be an expression of being filled with the Spirit of God. Not with some manufactured thing but a reality of God's presence with me. And it should carry me all through the day. Poetry, music, art, architecture have all been used to express this to God throughout all the ages, both Old Testament and New Testament. To try to think otherwise is just to deny the obvious and the true. And so we'll stand up and we'll say things that don't even make sense to some people. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Amazing love, unending love, amazing grace. Maybe even something more familiar. Oh, Lord, my God. And you can go from there. Or I'll fly away. Or this is my father's world. Or I come to the garden alone. We could do this for hours. And the point of the whole thing is obvious. It's for the ability to bring about an effect, not a to effect. The word effect with an A basically means to move without manipulating. God doesn't want to reach down and just shove you into something, but God has given us the capacity to express, to share, to encourage, to prod, to remember, to recall, to re- all these things. And the effect of these beautiful things are to touch our hearts in such a way so that when Satan comes after our heart and we find ourselves becoming discouraged or lonely or we feel like nobody cares or that we're not given enough credit or that nobody really wants to be my friend or and then real things come in, you know, all kinds of things, whether it's illness or financial setbacks or whatever it is, all these things, they happen in the heart. And that's where God has to reign in our lives. And so we should have the ability to be able to cry out and to express ourselves, not mechanically and not systematically, but heartfelt. It's okay in a sermon to scare somebody. It's okay to make them cry. But it's questionable if you want to make them laugh. And it's looked down upon if you want to go in some direction that seems to be too weighted in a positive sense. We've got to get back to this balanced understanding of what our worship is. 
to what God has called us to be. Because if we don't, we'll find ourselves in the situation described in Isaiah 29. Then the Lord says, these people draw near to me with their words, and they honor me with their lip service. But they've removed our hearts far from us. And their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by me. And God says, I don't want that kind of reverence. I do not want that kind of reverence. I want the reverence that comes from your heart. Not just your head. And not just in the comfort of something that is just regular and ordinary. Ascribe to him the glory that is his. To produce intimacy and have the ability to draw near. Why? Because God's an egotist? No. We already read it, so let's read it again. Psalm 42. As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. And my soul thirsts for you, the living God. When, men, when shall I come and appear before my God? My tears have been my food day and night. And while they say to me all, where is your God? But these things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving a multitude keeping festival. I would implore you to view our time here on Sunday morning as a time to encounter God's reality. Because I promise you with all of my heart, when you leave here, you're going to encounter Satan's reality. And if all you have are a bunch of dusty rituals, you ain't going to make it. That's just all there is to it. When things are worst in your life and you are satisfied with God, then you get it. He is your sanctuary. And so in the weeks and months and years to come, I hope that we will have a renewed desire to infuse our worship with deliberate intensity that shows reverence and expresses joy and brings back into focus what our life is all about. God is a wonderful God, and you do not want to come in his presence without the righteousness of Christ clothing your life. And so as we close this morning, let me simply encourage you to become a follower of Jesus Christ and to allow us to help you. If we can help you in any way this morning, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.